Hello, everyone. Welcome to Pharmaceutical Compliance Congress Digital Week, brought to you by the organizers of the Pharmaceutical Compliance Congress. My name is Esselia Masielu, and I'll be your host for today's session titled Compliant Communication, Why Is It Necessary? First, I'll cover some quick housekeeping items. Um, first, if you experience any difficulties with the audio or advancing slides, make sure you refresh your screen by pressing F5. If you're experiencing any other issues, hit the question mark button to re receive assistance. Uh, second, at any time during the presentation, um, submit your questions into the Q&A window on the left side of your screen. And third, in 24 hours, you'll receive a link to record the to watch the recording of this session. So now let's begin by introducing our two wonderful speakers. First, we have Kim Gregorio, uh, the Vice President yeah. of Business Development and Operations at P360, and Linda Pisot Grieg, the shareholder at Buchanan, Ingersoll, and Rooney. Thank you for joining us today, both of you. And now I'll hand it over to you guys to start the presentation. Thank you so much. Um, this is Linda Rieg, and today we're going to talk about a new update from the Department of Justice. And we know in the area of compliance, when the Department of Justice speaks, we listen. We know that this is the uh, focus for them as they're proceeding with their investigations and sometimes uh, sanctions against companies. And with limited resources in the compliance area, it's essential that we prioritize where we are putting our focus in working on our compliance programs. Um, I'm going to start with our finish, which is the recommendations that we have as a result of the new updates. And as you can see on this slide, we are at a point where it is important for companies to assess their company policies evaluate what are acceptable communication chains or document retention policies, and what are the consequences if someone is unwilling to comply with a company's approach to documents amongst its employees. In addition, training is front and center. We always are focused on exercising care in corporate communications, but now it's more important than ever. And it's important also to ensure that people understand the expectations of the company. And we would recommend also obtaining an annual attestation of compliance with the company's approach on those issues. And as you'll see when I hand this over to Kimberly, we're also going to be talking today about the importance of investing in technology solutions that directly respond to the Department of Justice's uh, hyper-focus on the topic of messaging applications and communications. So with that, I'm going to start in with what has prompted this topic at this time. As you may be aware, in March of 2023, this year, the U.S. Department of Justice released an updated version of its document entitled Evaluation of Corporate Compliance Programs. That document is 21 pages long. And a lot of it is sort of clarification of existing expectations for compliance programs. But we will be today talking about specifically the focus on messaging and communications within companies and how companies are retaining and utilizing those communications to execute on their compliance program. So what is this document and how does it fit into the overall scheme of things? Well, the Evaluation of Corporate Compliance Programs document is part of a larger initiative by the government that focuses on principles for federal prosecution of business organizations. And prosecutors are expected to evaluate the adequacy of a corporate compliance program at multiple time points, both when they're conducting an investigation or determining whether to bring charges and also when evaluating what outcome, what sanctions, or what plea agreement would be appropriate for a particular company. In addition, we know under the U.S. federal sentencing guidelines that corporate compliance programs and their adequacy are also a factor in calculating the criminal fine for corporate misconduct. So this is a really important update that we have in March of 2023, and let's dive into specifically what it says about messaging applications. You'll note that the topic messaging applications comes under the heading investigation of misconduct. 
the government is signaling that how companies approach messaging applications is specifically relevant to how effective the company can be in taking action if misconduct is suspected or if a whistleblower perhaps has, a potential whistleblower has called the hotline, does the company have the means to evaluate its business practices and take action either to correct misconduct or to prevent it? So the document says messaging applications have become ubiquitous in many markets and offer important platforms for companies to achieve growth and facilitate communication. In evaluating a corporation's policies and mechanisms for identifying, reporting, investigating, and remediating potential misconduct and violations of law, prosecutors should consider a corporation's policies and procedures governing the use of personal devices, communication platforms, and messaging applications, including ephemeral messaging applications. This is a major update that we haven't really seen this level of attention by prosecutors uh, much before this. This is very clear that they are focusing in on ephemeral messaging applications, among others. So what do we mean by that? Well, ephemeral usually means short-lived, and as you can see on this slide, it can include things like texting, WhatsApp, Slack, Signal, Telegram, uh, really all of the types of uh, communications that exist now that folks feel pretty comfortable engaging in in a somewhat informal manner. But the government is saying, look, if that's how company personnel are conducting their business and their communications, then we want companies to pay attention to those things and decide what's authorized. What is the company going to be able to monitor? Because that, those messaging channels may contain information or data that's relevant to audits, reviews, or investigations. If these uh, tools are being used at, for company-related communications, then does the company have a means to access, monitor, and preserve those communications? Or is there a policy either permitting or prohibiting their use? When the ECCP was released, we heard from Assistant Attorney General Kenneth Polite, and here's what he had to say. I am announcing significant changes to the ECCP, including how we consider a corporation's approach to the use of personal devices. If companies do not produce communications from these third-party messaging applications, our prosecutors will not accept that at face value. Department of Justice prosecutors will ask about the company's ability to access such communications, whether they are stored on corporate devices or servers, as well as applicable privacy and local laws, and that such responses or lack of responses may very well affect the offer it receives to resolve criminal liability. So let's go back to the ECCP and evaluate further what they are expecting here. They say policies governing such applications should be tailored to the corporation's risk profile and specific business needs and ensure that, as appropriate and to the greatest extent possible, business-related electronic data and communications are accessible and amenable to preservation by the companies. Prosecutors should consider how the policies and procedures have been communicated to employees and whether the corporation has enforced the policies and procedures on a regular and consistent basis in practice. They go on to share a number of questions that will be asked. In the area of communication channels, what electronic communication channels do the company and its employees use or allow to be used to conduct business? How does the practice vary by jurisdiction and business function and why? What mechanisms have been put in place to manage and preserve information? And what about preservation or deletion settings? What is the rationale for the company's approach? At the end of the day, the question is, does the company have a reasonable approach? Because you're going to need to be able to justify it to the Department of Justice and to the court if you had an investigation by the government or even a private litigant uh, bringing a lawsuit. We also consider in the policy environment in the ECCP what policies and procedures are in place to ensure that communications and other data is preserved from devices that are replaced. 
what are the relevant code of conduct, privacy, security, and employment laws or policies that govern the organization's ability to ensure security or monitor and access business-related communications. The use of personal devices is an interesting one because we do have occasions where individuals may be using a personal device. Bring your own device is very much prevalent in today's society. So the ECCP document goes on to say if a company has a bring your own device program, then what are the policies for information that may be stored on those personal devices? What is the company's data retention and business conduct policies and how are they being applied and enforced, especially if there is use of personal devices in a, in a corporate environment for corporate business, for the business of the company? Do the organization's policies permit the company to review communications that are used for advancing the business of the company on a bring your own device or other messaging application? And you can see on the slides that there's additional uh, questions that they are expecting prosecutors to be asking. Under the topic of risk management, the ECCP also asks, what are the consequences if you refuse company access? Is there a reasonable approach for the company to monitor what its employees are doing to conduct corporate activities? And does the company truly have a means to ensure that it can see those materials and communications? And what are the repercussions if an employee were to refuse? Has the use of personal devices or messaging applications, including ephemeral messaging applications, impaired in any way the organization's compliance program or its ability to conduct internal investigations. Remember, this entire section is related to the topic of investigating misconduct. And so they want to know that the company has policies in place and a means of overseeing and monitoring day-to-day -day actions within the company on the company's behalf. How does the organization manage security and exercise control over the communication channels used to conduct the organization's affairs? And is the organization's approach to permitting and managing communication channels reasonable in the context of the company's business needs and risk profile? Have we seen the government take action? Well, we have seen that occur even before the release of this document with a $1.8 billion settlement directed to the financial industry. 16 financial institutions were uh, hit with this sanction, this settlement, as a result of lax record keeping. And the SEC investigation said we're seeing pervasive off-channel communications involving senior and junior investment bankers and traders and a long-standing failure to preserve electronic communications which must be available to regu regulators to ensure market integrity. The failure to keep electronic records such as text messages between employees on personal devices such as mobile phones was front and center in leading to that settlement. And the fact that in March, a few months later, they would issued this updated ECCP and incorporated this hyper-focus on the use of communications and taking advantage of updates in what technology permits is really a heads up to the industry, including the pharma industry, that this is uh, an area of scrutiny by the government. So let's take a WhatsApp or personal texting hypothetical. If a WhatsApp or texting were occurring, uh, WhatsApp communications or texting were occurring through a personal account that's routinely used for work activities, the company may be limited in its ability to exercise oversight, and they will have no means to ensure that company-related communications are kept. For example, if there were a litigation hold that needed to be in, put in place, or a need for an investigation by the corporate compliance department, or for a routine monitoring that a compliance department is expected to undertake. What about if an employee departs the company or a personal device is lost or stolen? Is there a backup? Is there some means to ensure that those communications remain available? And then pharmace pharmaceutical companies also have regulatory retention and reporting obligations and obligations to comply. If your company is doing all of the right things to ensure that they're 
in compliance with FDA regulatory requirements and lawful promotion of products, et cetera. These documents may be very important not only for the purposes of responding to the government's expectations, but also there could be good documents that you are no longer able to access because a personal device is used or an employee leaves and there's no backup that the company has access to. So let's think about what are the action items for compliance programs in light of this update. Well, document retention policies and company access need to be revisited. Generally speaking, there's no duty to preserve text and instant messaging if a party does not routinely save those messages and litigation is not anticipated. But the reality is we have to be proactive, especially in light of the ECCP updates, to ensure that we have the ability to take action if needed. The ECCP now highlights the government's interest in the company's approach, and particularly with regard to ephemeral platforms. And so with that in mind, the time is ripe for companies to consider carefully their document retention policies and their approach for sharing with employees what is acceptable and what is unacceptable in terms of electronic communication channels. Whether a company has access to information on different electronic communication channels will impact the government's perception of the effectiveness of a corporate compliance program, and it's important that this be put as a top priority for companies now in light of this update. We also need to consider if you had a document retention policy that allowed for these ephemeral communications to be deleted in a short time frame, what happens in the case of a legal hold? A legal hold notice will come into play if a litigation is pending or reasonably foreseeable, and it imposes on a company an obligation to retain and preserve documents and information relevant to the lawsuit, including ESI, electronically stored information, and to cease any practice, process, or procedure that would destroy purge, erase, delete, or alter data, documents, or electronically stored information. It's also important under a legal hold notice to identify those who would have relevant information that needs to be preserved and ensure that automatic delete functions, if any, have been discontinued. Failure to comply with this duty can result in an adverse inference and a jury charge can be given on spoliation of evidence. Has a company taken reasonable steps to preserve potentially relevant documents? This is an additional reason why renewed attention to what are we doing in terms of the chat function or texting and what devices are being utilized and what is the company's ability to access that information and to take the necessary action if a legal hold is released, if a legal hold notice is shared, this is um, an additional reason why it's really important to revisit our approach. My past experience um, has been to work not only as a counselor to pharmaceutical companies today, but in my past life to work as a litigation attorney defending pharmaceutical companies. And I use this example of what an adverse inference at trial can look like. So imagine if you did not have your legal hold notice uh, executed appropriately, and you are now faced with a claim that could result in sanctions, financial sanctions to the company, um, and uh, a, a, a perception that the company has not undertaken its obligations under our legal hold notice appropriately, you can end up with an adverse inference at trial such as this. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll see a lot of documents, but there are a lot you are not going to see. There are a lot of documents I haven't gotten to see. Documents were destroyed. An order was entered by this court at the very beginning of this case, and the documents were not to be destroyed, but they were not produced. It has already been found that thousands of documents and emails among the people of the company in the time that matters most to this case don't exist, and they don't exist for the simple reason that the company destroyed the documents. The legal implications of that destruction you will hear at the end of this case from the judge. So as you can see, the ECCP and the litigation hold mandate 
are two very compelling reasons why it's important to now revisit the company's approach to how it is engaging in document retention and what steps it has taken to ensure that it has appropriate access for um, those communications that are being conducted to advance the interests of the business. And I'm now going to turn it over to Kim, who's going to talk to you about one technology solution that does offer a tremendous amount in terms of some of the key considerations that we've talked about today. Thank you so much, Linda. Hi, everybody. I'm Kim Gregorio with uh, P360. And as Linda was mentioning, there's a lot of ways that you can think about how you're going to revisit these guidelines that we have seen come out from the DOJ. Um, but another way you can think about it is implementing a technology solution, right? And so at P360, we have one. There's a lot of um, technology solutions out there, but not a lot that offer the uniqueness and ease of use like our Zing Engagement Suite. Um, and so what the Zing Engagement Suite can offer you is compliant um, text messaging and WhatsApp messaging. And when I say compliant, that means it's tracking all of those messages. So you have full view into what is being said between your company and your targets, right? Whether it be the HCPs or patients or caregivers or administrators. Um, but it also does so much more. It has um, voice calling. It has a video platform. And that video platform, you can get in instant videos. You have the ability to send forms and um, help your customer fill out forms. We, um, it offers a compliant signature platform as well. So you can gather those signatures, whether it be for samples or whether it be for um, medical information, um, all of that. Um, Zing can also offer you um, scheduling, multi-party scheduling. It can offer you a QR code with an intelligent bot. This intelligent bot can be trained on your um, information, so it can become real smart real quick um, and give your customers the answers that they need. But what it's really doing is it's being able to pre give you that data that you need to be able to put some of these policies in place um, for your for your company. And when I talk about some of the messaging that Zing can do, um, you can do standard text messaging. Hey, how's it going? You know, did you see the game last night? Any of those that you normally would communicate with your customers. But you can also have templated pre-approved messaging about the product, which is super important when it comes to pharmaceuticals and life sciences. Um, you have these approved templates that can't be altered by the user, and they can go right out. So you could have a rep that's in a regular conversation with their HCP. They're texting about a baseball game or a football game, and then the HCP says, hey, you showed me a study last week. Do you have that? In typical cases, your rep has to change channels and go to a pre-approved email to send that to their HCP. From a marketing perspective, they don't like to change channels very much. From a compliance perspective, you see no other way. Zing allows them to send that already approved document through the same platform because you're getting a whole history of what is being said. There's also that scare of what if they say something they're not supposed to? Well, that is where the company can preload in um, keywords that can be blocked, socially unacceptable words, as well as keywords about the product. And you'll see in that second screenshot, that's what they're doing. It's blocking that socially inappropriate um, word. And as I mentioned, we have um, it has the compliant signature capture. So when a physician needs to provide a signature, whether it be for sample from Merform or, or anything that they were getting a signature for, the rep can send it to them. Once they sign, it's time stamped, the IP address is captured. It's done with their finger, so it's considered that wet signature. It's not done as a typed signature. So you're getting all of the pieces that you are needed to capture that signature compliantly. Let's see here. We've talked about needing to have that record, keeping that record. And so here's what you can see in this particular technology with saying, we're capturing that full 
conversation history. You can see what templates were sent. You can see what conversational text was sent. There are dashboards that will show you time of day, everything that was, what product was discussed. Those dashboards can be highlighted for um, compliance to review certain conversations. So you're getting all of that information that you typically wouldn't have if a rep were texting on their own device. So to kind of recap everything that you heard today, right, you, you've got, you need to assess your current company policies and how, how are they falling in line with what came out from the DOJ guidance last year. Looking at your training and refreshers, how are you doing your communication channels? What, are you, what is the guidance that you're giving to your um, customer service representatives? And then start to explore those technology solutions. Right, which, which ones can help you retain what you need to retain in a secure manner? So I'm going to open up the floor for question and answer. And I believe there's some in here. Yeah, so Kim, I see as yeah. one of the questions, how does Zing gather text from a personal device or do you have to text through a certain app? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so Zing itself is a web-based application. It has an iOS and an Android app, um, but the rep uses the app and the recipient, your HCP or patient, they have just regular messaging on their side. But the rep is using an application. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that I understand about the Zing platform is that you really are just utilizing your phone, but being able to select the P360 Zing platform to have it come through a corporate phone number, especially assigned. And yep. the company's own approaches with regard to data privacy, can span, TCPA, the things that are associated with ensuring that you're managing that um, data set appropriately are all going to be dictated by the company's approach on those major topics. And, and so it does offer a lot of flexibility, but enables those texts that are coming out of the phone to be now captured as corporate communications rather than personal communications. Is that right? Yes, exactly. And what Zing does is it does follow the company's data retention policy. So if the company's data retention says these messages need to be retained for 10 years, it will be held for 10 years, 15 years, seven years, whatever that is. Um, so there's, there's, we do follow all of the guidelines within the local jurisdiction. So if you're deploying in Europe and there's special laws within um, the EU, those are also followed um, within Zing. So you have complete control over how that looks and feels. Um, and you own the phone numbers. So each rep is assigned their own individual phone number. That is now owned by the company. Yeah, and you mentioned the local requirements and the GDPR and the overseas requirements, and I think that's a really important aspect that you are very focused on. I know for us, when we're counseling companies on communications, we have um, you know companies that have connection with overseas entities, a parent affiliate or what have you, and the GDPR uh, expectations are really important. We're in the healthcare industry, so. Um, protection of communications under the California privacy law, Connecticut, Colorado, Idaho, Virginia, Utah. These are all things that we work with companies to ensure they're taking the right steps to comply with. And I know in speaking with you, Kim, that you are very hyper-focused on those expectations and requirements as well. And the system can be adapted to ensure that those, uh, those legal requirements are being complied with. Exactly. We, we take that very seriously. Um, P360 is made up of a bunch of people who work inside pharma, so we understand the importance of that. Um, and so we definitely take that very seriously on our side, and we try to work to make sure everything will meet your needs. So I see another question. So does everybody get a second phone number that is attached to Zing? So there are two numbers on their cell phone? 
Yes. So when they get a login for Zing, or when they use their login to log into Zing, they are assigned a new phone number, which is separate from their regular cell phone number. Um, and so when this is pre presented to their customers or their targets, they usually are presenting it, hi, you know, I got a new work phone number. I'm going to be communicating with you through this phone number going forward. I'll send you a quick text message with a contact card so you can save it into your contacts for future reference. Um, but yes, they will be getting a second phone number, a virtual phone number that is used through the Zing app aside from the phone number on their local phone. Um, and, I, and I know that, you know, sort of my iPhone has allowed me now to select where a communication is coming from email. So that's a pretty impressive innovation that you all offer um, with, your, with your application. So we have another question. Does the recipient know that the message is coming from the messaging application as opposed to iMessage, SMS? So no, uh, from the recipient end, they are only seeing the messages or regular SMS or WhatsApp. So we're using WhatsApp in our European clients um, and SMS here on the state side. But the recipient does not know it's coming through an app. They only see it as a regular message. And, and I think the second phone number is really the key to that, that it is a communication on behalf of the company, right? I mean, that's the... That's the right. that, that specially identified number that's specific for, for corporate communications now has um, the ability to have the company have access, the ability to monitor, and um, and you know it does allow for the individual to differentiate between communications on a device that's used for personal but also corporate work. Exactly, and the 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 second phone number is a, a regular ten digit phone number. So to the recipient, they're just like I said, they're just introducing it as a new phone number, a new business phone number. And I see another mm -hmm. question. Does P360 have a product that monitors other ephemeral apps that a rep may accidentally use, perhaps something that monitors for keywords and only shows the company when a keyword is triggered? I, unfortunately, no, P360 does not have that um, available at this time. Um, we rely on the company to do training with their reps, just as they do today, letting them know that if they are going to use a messaging application, they would have to use Zing. They are not to use any other messaging applications within their phone. Just similarly as you do today when you tell them you must use your corporate email, you cannot use your personal Gmail to, to discuss with your clients. And one, one of the other things that we've talked about is, you know, sort of the TCPA, can spam, you know, requirements. And so would you like to talk, I mean, so that's something that we've talked about with our clients and they are um, laws that are, you know, they have very significant fines because they're per violation fines that will kick in. So it does impress me that the P360 approach is one where there's, you know, sort of an expectation that the company is paying attention to those requirements and the the phone numbers that are utilized are uh, utilized with consent from those that you're reaching out to. Um, would you want to address that a little bit? Yes. So when procuring these phone numbers, we procure those 10-digit phone numbers because we intend them to be used for one-on-one -on -one communication. Um, we partner with large communications firms to procure these phone numbers, and they help us with the, lo with the guidance within jurisdiction that we're deploying. Um, as far as the can spam laws are, um, when somebody wants to not receive these messages and they reply stop, you have one opportunity to reply back to them um, confirming that they've opted out, and that's it. And so we take that very seriously. So if somebody replies stop, you, that person cannot be texted from that phone number anymore. It's locked. It's locked immediately. It's not even a delayed lock. And when we send back that message, it's crafted based on what the company um, wants it to say, but it will give instructions how to opt back in. So you still have that window if they want to opt back in. Um, but we do take um, following those guidelines very, very um, seriously, which is why we, we recommend an introduction text to say, hey, this is, this is Kim. You know, I'm, this is my new work phone number. Please say this in your contacts. If you ever don't want to communicate me through this channel, you can opt out. Like, replying stop or something along those lines, you know, 
however you want to craft that. And there's another question, does the app have the capability to import contacts or is that a manual process the rep would need to engage in? Yes, so um, Zing has full capabilities to connect through APIs to whichever system of record that you're using for um, your sales reps. So a, a lot of your companies are using either Salesforce or Viva and we have the pre-built APIs so that when your rep um, logs in, it will automatically pull their universe in to the Zing app and they will only see their HCPs and their contacts right in there. If you collect HCP personal phone numbers, which most companies do not, those would flow through. If you do not collect those, the reps would have the ability to um, add those in with each HCP. Um, they can do that either manually or their iPhone or Android offers a way to look it up from their address book and put it in from a copy and paste. But um, usually what's happening is the reps are going in and saying, hey, doc, do you mind? I have to start communicating with you through this new channel. I'm going to send you a text message. Is that okay? Let me put your phone number in. They send that introduction text, and they just move about their day from there. Yeah, and I, I think the, the aspect here that the company's legal department or outside counsel will help to ensure that the way the technology is being leveraged is taking into consideration data privacy, TCPA, cybersecurity, but it is, you know, sort of adaptable to respond to the company's um, requirements in that regard. And it sounds like the approach that's utilized is one that is uh, customizable based on the company's needs and interpretation of those requirements. There's another question. Is there a plan to have the application available through iOS or Android for download in the future? So it is currently available as an application in iOS and Android. It's not in the public store because each application is crafted specifically for the company with your rules in behind. So we don't put it through the public app store for Android and iOS, but it's on what we call the, I guess, the private app store so that you can access it for your company or your company's app store. We send the app through that, but we do have an iOS and Android version of it as well. And another question, are companies implementing enterprise-wide or typically for sales reps only? Yes, so we are seeing this implemented um, enterprise-wide. So we have largely with the sales reps, but we're starting to see it implemented for MSLs directly to HCPs. And then we have some of our device companies that are in implementing it for patient use. So you have a patient on a, a device um, and they, they're – device is triggering an alarm, so now they need to talk to somebody. They're now messaging with that person that they would normally have to call. Um, so we are seeing it in many use cases across the enterprise. Yeah, and I, I think another question that's raised is, well, who, who has an interest in the company to sort of consider this type of technology or, you know, sort of the overall um, buy-in of the company's new approach that uh, would apply to communication channels that are acceptable, unacceptable? What are the departments that should have a seat at that table? Um, I know from my perspective, you know, it certainly seems like legal, compliance, IT are sort of front and center. And then I think, KG, you, uh, you can maybe share from your perspective you know, who are the drivers that typically introduce this at their companies and what other stakeholders do you see regularly participating? Yes, absolutely. Like you said, the legal and the compliance IT, but really your sales operations, your commercial teams, they're really coming in. And now we're seeing a more a, a peak interest in your patient services area, um, right? So the ones that have a complicated therapeutic where they have to constantly be in touch with the patients to make sure they're on on product and on product correctly, um, we're seeing a renewed interest um, in in that area as well. But usually, the commercial team is who's at the table. Yeah, and what's interesting to me is, you know, sort of we've moved into an era where having this informal discussion is, um, you know, sort of 
the everyday experience of many of us, all of us in the workplace. And, and so it really does uh, play up from my perspective that at the same time that you would be adopting ideally an approach that enables you to have the ability to monitor and um, take action if a legal hold, hold notice is released. Um, there's obviously really important reasons why companies need to revisit their policies at this point in time. At the same time, I would say the sensitivity in corporate communications does also have to go hand in hand with that. Um, there is a sense that, you know, sort of this informal discussion is one that doesn't have uh, a long-term retention and people do become quite informal. But, um, you know, now more than ever, I do think that sensitivity in corporate communications is is really important. Um, I teach a class at the Rutgers Business School, and I remember early on in my career teaching, um, I sort of asked for students to, to share their takeaways, and I um, was sort of, sort of laughing because uh, we did have to do a little bit of a tweak at the end of the semester to address you know, the sensitivity in corporate communications, because again, it's about creating good documents that show that the company does adhere to appropriate approaches and how it engages with healthcare providers and uh, others that are important stakeholders. Um, and I think in that one instance, it was sort of like, whatever I write, whatever I do, don't write it down. It's really not about that. People are writing it down. We've even seen um, a, a swing in, in the pendulum, pendulum with, you know, sales rep call notes and, well, gee, we're going to limit the ability to write what the outcome of an interaction with a healthcare provider was and we're going to limit them to check boxes. And ultimately, it's going to be written down somewhere. And so then the subpoenas are for the personal journals or record keeping that are outside of the eyes of the company. The reality is we're trying to do things in accordance with what the law requires. And this is an occasion where it's valuable to have record management that enables the company to monitor and to control com company communications in a way that ensures that the good documents are preserved as well. And so it's not about don't write it down. I mean, in some instances, certainly a conversation in person versus a written uh, communication may be the order of the day. But ultimately, it's about being uh, adherent to our code of conduct, engaging in compliant communications, and having a means to monitor and take action that allows the company to you know, sort of manage records that belong to them. And, and I think the, the government's focus with this DOJ release in March of this year really is uh, an important development. At the same time that the March um, release occurred this year, we've also seen an updated uh, policy on self-voluntary disclosure. And as companies undertake to revisit their communication policies, there are great incentives for voluntary disclosure um, and, you know, the, the government is promising, um, you know, some uh, significant uh, value given to if you've self-identified an issue that they will, will give the company a benefit for taking proactive action. Um, so right. that also was released this year. And I think that's we have one question about summarizing the main takeaways, but I wanted to make sure there weren't any other questions. So to summarize sort of the main takeaways from this presentation, um, you know, I think we really just wanted to come out here and talk to you guys about taking a look at those policies, like Linda just said, um, really reviewing them, understanding them, and give you a little peek into what technologies are available out there to assist in this. And I don't know, Linda, if you want to add to that. No, I, I think you've summed it up perfectly. Um, important update from the ECCP and uh, really important to evaluate technology solutions that will help you to comply with that. Um, great. So, yeah, I think we're all gone through all the questions for today. So thanks so much, Kim and Linda, for the great presentation. 
Um, if anyone submitted a question that wasn't addressed, um, keep in mind that the speakers will reach out to you directly. Um, note again that the session was recorded and you'll receive a notification in about 24 hours when the on-demand session is available for viewing. Um, before you log off, uh, please take a moment to complete the feedback form so we can continue to improve your digital week experience. And on behalf of Informa Connect Life Sciences, I hope you have a great day. Thank you.